Hello, everyone. My name is Horal Kasimi. I'm the president of the Africa Institute and Sharjah Arts Foundation in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. We're ha very happy to hold this webinar today and would like to welcome all our registered participants to the second in a series of screening programs organized by the Africa Institute in collaboration with Sharjah Art Foundation and the Royal College of Art in London. The programs are driven by the educational mission of the collaborating institutions as a contribution to the understanding through film and art of the recent protest movement across the globe against anti-Black racism. They also explore the African and Black intellectual traditions through the contributions of specific figures to critical theory and humanities. Today's webinar focuses on the work of acclaimed Malayan American professor and filmmaker Mansha Diawara. It also concludes the second program with a discussion after making three of his films, An Opera of the World, Edouard Glisson, One World in Relation, and Negritude, a dialogue between Senghor and Wole Seinka, available to stream through the Africa Institute's website during these last three days. Just a few notes about today's webinar before I start introducing the speakers. The webinar is currently being live streamed on the Africa Institute's YouTube channel and will also be posted there with Arabic subtitles in the future. We will take questions from the audience through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screens and we'll try our best to answer as many as possible. It's with great pleasure that I welcome our speakers for today. We have professor and filmmaker Mansha Diawara. Mansha was born in Mali in West Africa. He holds the title of University Professor of the Humanities and Arts at New York University. His writings on art, cinema and politics have appeared in the New York Times, LA Times, Liberation, Media Part and Art Forum. He's author of two acclaimed memoirs, In Search of Africa, published with Harvard University Press, and We Won't Budge, An African Exile in the World, published with Basic Civitas Books. He has also published several books on African and African-American cinema. Diawara's notable films include An Opera of the World, 2017, Negritude, A Dialogue Between Soyinka and Senghor, 2016, Edouard Glisson, One World in Relation, 2010, Maison Tropicale, 2008, and Rouge in Reverse in 1995. We're happy to also have Bonaventure Tsobijang Ndikang, a Cameroonian independent art curator and biotechnologist. He is founder and artistic director of the space Savvy Contemporary in Berlin, and editor-in-chief of the journal Savvy Journal for critical texts on contemporary African art. He was curator at large for Adams and Chick's Documenta 14. His recent curatorial projects include If You Are So Smart, Why Ain't You Rich? on the Economy of Knowledge, Marrakesh Biennial Satellite 2014, Giving Contours to Shadows, Neue Berliner Kunstverein, Gorky Theater, Gemal de Galerie, Savvy Contemporary as well as Satellites in Dakar, Johannesburg, Nairobi, and Marrakesh, to name a few. We also are very happy to have Jihan Al Tahiri, an Egyptian writer and filmmaker. She has authored, directed, and produced award winning documentary films, authored books, and reported on political conflicts in the Middle East and Africa. Jihan is a member of the Executive Bureau of the Federation of Pan African Cinema and Secretary General of the Guild of African Filmmakers in the Diaspora. Jihan was also the Tunis special correspondent for the Washington Post, the Financial Times, US News and World Report while in Tunisia. The main stories covered were the PLO, Islamic movements and Algeria. While living in Egypt, she was the Cairo correspondent for the Sunday Times and correspondent for Reuters news agency. I'd like to thank you all for accepting our invitation to this program and taking the time to do so. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Jihan, would you like to start? The... Uh, okay, ladies first, I guess. <laughs> I think the best way to start is uh, reminiscing a bit. Um, I was just trying to think back uh, as to one of the, it's probably not the first time I met Mantia, but the one I remember most uh, in Ghana, in I think it must have been 2006, Six, not 2005, around there. Yeah. So uh, this morning I was thinking, damn, that's a long time. <laughs> and um, and uh, one of the things that that really uh, made me think a lot uh, was uh, here we were in a space of an African film festival which is, um, of course, we've been to many and we know many, but it was the one place where 
what we call the African diaspora came together. And I remember very specifically, uh, there was Sinclair um, Bourne, Sinclair Bourne, Sinclair, Sinclair Bourne and, and William Greaves. Yeah. And, uh, and Mantia was like so at ease in both these worlds. And, and for me, it was a very important moment because it was really the moment that I recognized that I actually didn't know the distinctions between these two worlds that well, we just presume that it's all the same, we're all African or all black or whatever appellation it is. And so it was thanks to Mantia that I kind of went back home and said, okay, I have to read up on all of this. So, uh, and of course Mantia's films um, uh, have marked us all. And we've been running into each other in Fespaco for years and years. Uh, but I, I'm not going to get into the films because we're getting into them in a minute. So I'm really honored and delighted to be invited to have this chat with you, Mantia. The honor is mine. I can't believe you have such a memory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm supposed to wait. I come back, but thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, actually, let me just add one thing. He was part of something called NAFTI, which is very little known, but very important. It's an American, I think, funded institution for filmmaking in Africa. And this institution, thanks to him in many ways, um, has a completely, a whole class a whole generation of filmmakers that came out with this double knowledge. So voila, I just forgot to add this. I like <laughs> stubborn knowledge. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, also, thanks from my end. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And um, yeah, where to start? I, I, I can't go back as far as Jihan, <laughs> Jihan's relation to, to Mantia. But um, I remember we invited uh, Mantia to Berlin in 2015 uh, for a project that Simon Jami had curated at Savi Contemporary. And he came to give a keynote lecture. The, the, the project was called Viesin Ale Berliner. We're all Berliner to com commemorate uh, 130 years of the Congo Conference, you know. and. Uh, one thing I said for the introduction of Mantia then that uh, I think is still true for today is um, how Mantia succeeded in making complex issues, you know, uh, those of us that had been struggling to, to understand it were glissant, you know, <laughs> Mantia had this ability to break it down, you know, there's, there's a moment in in dancing, you know, when they say you break it down. <laughs> that mm -hmm. is a, in Cameroon, we say malater, you know, mm -hmm. you bring the ball to the ground, you know. So Mantia had this, has this incredible capacity to, to, to make the most complex things understandable, you know, and, and uh, that is what I said for the introduction. I still think it's the case today. And we will talk about that in a bit, you know, be it about negritude, be it about, you know, Egyptian's philosophy about huge topics you know and it goes always for the most epic <laughs> it doesn't go for small things you know and um which we we appreciate a lot but i wanted to say um in in having this opportunity to to watch the films again one thing uh became clear to me and i would like to seize this opportunity to to make a kind of a dedication, you know, or to convoke or invoke a spirit, you know, that left us a few weeks ago, and it is the spirit of Jacques Rousseau. Mm. You know, um, our very dear friend who touched all of us in different ways, but it was incredible to, to see him again um, in, in one world in relation, you know, you know, playing his trumpet, you know, um, uh, being this element and also thinking of the way, in my opinion, um, he becomes a, a protagonist in all three of these films, <laughs> you know, in, in a way, even, even with the fact that he wasn't, uh, uh, even though he's not present in the negritude 
uh, dialogue uh, between Senghor and Soyinka, but we know that he has mediated and thought deeply about negritude. And, and I am mentioning this especially because one of the things I regret so much about his passing is the fact that he sent me one of his final papers a few months ago. And um, for, for lack of time or whatever, I didn't really read it, you know. So this gave me the opportunity to go back to it, you know, which is uh, Negritude La Gramme de Caliban. You know, uh, and it is only Jacques here that can do it that way. And um, and also thinking of, um, yes, the, 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 the third film in question, which concerns itself with, with the, the, the form of the opera as the medium of narration, you know. And um, I had to think about Jacques as well, you know. And also in one of the last mails to me when he talked about uh, the album we just released with him, and he talked about the importance of the lament, you know, and um, yes, I'll end on that note. And we could also use this opportunity to, to uh, wish him uh, uh, a smooth passage to the yonder. Well, thank you, uh, Bonan, uh, for bringing Jacques Courcil up, but also for accepting uh, the invitation to participate in this discussion, because uh, it, you know, allow me for one minute, though. Uh, it, otherwise, I will not be a, a good Malian if I, <laughs> I do not pause for a moment uh, to thank uh, Kour al Kasimi for uh, the Saja Foundation and the Africa Institute. If I did not think Salah Hassan, uh, who's been a friend forever, uh, and then the Africa Institute, and just meeting uh, Satahan, who uh, has been very gracious, where it looked like I ha I've known him forever. He's been great. Uh, but to have Jihan and you participate in this event, uh, you all are friends, so to say it's an honor. Uh, it it looks like I'm kind of taking a distance from you. I'm close to you, so I can't say it's an honor. Uh, Jihan is right, you know, we, we go way back. And what is wonderful about uh, Jihan, she's not telling you, is that an African woman Egyptian woman, French woman, West Af South African and West African woman, she always succeeded in making her voice heard. You know, and she's with thugs like myself and other people, and we think we know everything. Jihan will come and put all of us in our places. <laughs> and this has been going on for years. It's not, it didn't just start. So I, I have great admiration but because she's a friend, I'll leave it at a very casual level. And uh, so it, I'm really happy that you agreed to do this. Thank uh, you. Bona, of course, uh, here is the situation. When Bona invited me to Savi, uh, we talk about Berlin Conference, Fanon and all these things. But what happened really is that it's because of Bona, to him, or maybe he knew it, that Documenta selected me to do an opera of the world. So, so really you have these connections uh, like that. And every once in a while when he began to talk about unthinking or the difficulties of, uh, you know, not going into the mainstream, uh, he provokes me in a way that Gleason like to provoke you, you know, if, uh, I was telling Salah yesterday that I, call, I, I called Angela Davis to tell her, to remind her of a camp. I took her three years ago to different New York University campuses in, in Europe, to Florence uh, and then to Paris. After, and she's talking about the prison industrial complex, but at the very end of the conference, people will ask her questions. 
uh, you know, uh, we'll come back to this, but I'm just, I just want to preface this. They will say, what is the meaning of Black Lives Matter? Why are they saying this? Does it mean that other people's lives don't matter? We'll get back, we'll get to this. But anyway, I called, uh, after George Floyd's death, I called Angela Davis to say, you know, the whole world is talking about Black Lives Matter. Uh, not only in the US, more white people are talking about it than black people. And then Angela stopped me, said, Mancha, that's now in the mainstream. Let's go to more difficulties, the difficulty, now that everybody has embraced it, let them keep it. Let's go to the difficult areas now and bring them to the mainstream and we'll make a better world. But I really, will, I hope we can come back to this because uh, when I, uh, Warner talks about unthinking, that just reminded me of that. But you know, it's actually it's in a way, in a way uh, that's a great intro because the whole idea of now that it's in the mainstream, let's deal with more difficult things yes. is what your films actually do. <laughs> so uh, so uh, um, your films in many ways, um, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it, it's, it's very easy to turn this quickly into compliments and things like that. I think we should go beyond that right, fairly yeah. quickly because obviously we're both here because these are films that were real markers mm -hmm. and real challenges in, in, in many ways, not just in terms of in terms of format, in terms of content, in terms of sometimes in some of the films personally, I really wanted to argue with the film. I wanted to jump into the conversation and say, hold on a minute, but what about this? <laughs> Especially in the Soyenka Sangor one. Um, but um, so I'm, I'm going to actually start, if you don't mind, in a way where I left off because um, this combination of the two diasporas which I encountered and got me thinking with your first encounter says a lot about yourself. So I'm very curious to know how you navigate these diasporas and how you got there in the first place. Okay, let me see. I'm from Mali and uh, in, in that sense, you know, the word decolon decolonial is very fashionable uh, these days. In, uh, in that sense, uh, my struggle was with France. Born in Mali, therefore, uh, you speak French, you do things the French way, you know, what Senghor called la francité. You know, this is, even your brains get formatted to have the French syntax. You know, it's not just language, it's the body movements and everything. So uh, my struggle with that uh, from birth, because we had come up in the 60s and the 60s also were, uh, we were introduced to the 60s uh, through Sam Ben Usman that he knew very well, a common friend, uh, through Fanon. In fact, I like to tell people in French just to shock them. Uh, I say, look, Fanon m'a appris à penser et Edouard Glissant m'a libéré. You know, Fanon taught me how to think. You know, thinking structure in our areas, but also I think around the world. Fanon is the, but he just gives you the dialectics, he, the structure of thinking and how to represent yourself how to make yourself visible in a discussion. And, and I had that, that, that load on my shoulder, uh, even through the US, it was even easier to carry that load on my shoulders in the US than in Africa until I met Edouard Glissant. And he was like, it was, it was like he took that load off my shoulders and said, relax breathe a little bit and so on. So I said, so Fanon taught me how to think and Gleason liberated me. Now this brings me to, to, to your point. When I, when, I came to, when I came to the US. How did you get there? I mean, like start well, a bit earlier, what's your parcours? Well, okay, 
very, very fast because uh, I went to Paris like all Francophone students and went to Vincennes, spent two years, and then met a poet called uh, Ted Jones. I met a, a poet called Ted Jones, and Ted Jones is really a bebop poet, a jazz poet, a surreal, surrealist poet, African-American hanging around in Paris, uh, reading at Shakespeare and Company. And African students, you know, we go Saint Boulevard Saint-Germain, we want to meet women, we want to do this, but Ted Jones was the best at doing this. So we all followed him. You know, and Ted Jones one day finished reading his poems and then basically said something to the effect that because he knew my desire, I just wanted to be like him. He said in the audience, he said, that guy sitting back there, he understood what I said. And then everybody turned and looked at me because, you know, so I got some of his success. But anyway, long story short, Ted Jones told me one day, he said, look, French people like me and African-Americans but they don't like you African immigrants. But in America, they like Africans. They don't like us Black Americans. He gave me addresses and I went to the US. And it, 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 it's, it, it's complicated, it's complex, everything, but that's, so Paris, Bamako, Paris, and uh, Washington DC where I went to American University. But what is interesting is that I could have done what many Africans did and still do. I could have remained an immigrant and not joined the Black struggle in the US. Because immigrants, whether they're coming from France, Italy, Senegal, they come to work, finish their studies, go back home, and they carry all the prejudice against African Americans that white people have against African American. And then I, I would have been admired, I speak French and uh, all these things, finish my studies, if find a job, it wouldn't have stopped me from finding a job, but I would isolate myself from African American communities. But because of Ted Jones, and I become friends with Tony Kid Bambara, I become friends with Amiri Baraka. He gave me address, you know, that Stokely Carmichael and so on. So really I, but also I spent childhood in Guinea and Guinea with Sekuture was what, you know, Nasser, Sekuture, Modibo Keita and uh, Kwame Nkrumah. You remember Nyerere to some extent, but this was a block in Africa. So there, and the African-American were also joining that block in the, a block in the stroke struggle. So for me, it was not that strange to, to really reverse. I mean, it, it, it's an effort for the mind. Gleason talks about this, you know, remembering is not, is not a problem for him. What, what is a problem for him is giving up thinking about making the connection, you know, but remembering what I was, that's not, that's okay, but that's mm. not, mm. but it's a form mental. Mm. Mm. So for me, it, it was doable to make the leap from a noble so-called African who went to African schools, who has, who can trace his ancestry to uh, the Jawara family of, let's say, uh, 400 years and so on. Uh, and then keep my distance like many Francophone African intellectuals do vis-a-vis -vis the Africans. But I actually look for my liberation through Fanon from the mm. Black mm. And that, that really was the issue. Mm. You know, that mm. they, it's not my nobility, wherever I came from in Africa, that's going to liberate me in this mm. industrialized world, in mm. this very complex, racist, uh, system, systemically, systematically structured world that mm. I needed to embrace the African-American struggle. So okay. I did that from college to, to the PhD. And of course, yeah, yeah that, that's the long, long, long answer okay. to Jihan's question. Okay. 
my, my dear, um, thanks for that uh, biographical note. Uh, I mean, it makes a lot of sense now uh, to, to think of the works uh, through uh, those lenses. Uh, I wanted to, to zoom in to the work, you know, first from a, a broader point of view, then we can get into the details. But I, listening to you talk right now, I was thinking about uh, Glisson talking about the Creole garden. Yes. You know, and uh, I wanted to use that analogy, that idea of the many trees he talked about, you know, the avocado and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. and him discussing his idea of the rhizomatic, the rhizome, you know, the rhizomatic principle. Mm -hmm. But try to look at your films as the trees in that Creole garden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how they connect to each other. So I would like you to talk about that because I see the threats uh, being, you know, the notion of Africanness, you know, through all the works, you know, issues of migration through all the works, the idea of democracy through all the works, borders through all the works, you know. So it seems as if these works themselves are part of that rhizomatic garden that uh, uh, um, is talking about. And so maybe... using the, you know yeah the, the last part i did not get but i oh. think I, I understand no. your question yeah okay uh yeah but i want to go back and thank you for bringing bringing up jacques courcil jacques courcil the who was a jazz musician uh in new york here who is uh an incredible linguist. People don't talk much about this. Uh, people talk about his poetry and his music, but you know, he, he comes from that moment uh, of uh, structuralist linguistics with A.J. Graymas, uh, Todorov, and so on. He comes from that school. Uh, he's an incredible, was an incredible linguist philosopher. But also, uh, Jacques Courcil, uh, was is the only person, you know, in Francophone systems, it's like the Arabic systems, you memorize things by heart. So if you say you know Baudelaire, you have to know your Baudelaire by heart. Jacques Courcil was the only guy who could take any glissant poem, no matter it could be 50 pages, he could come play trumpet and recite it. I, so, I, I, I agree with that. You've seen it, right? Yes, I've seen it. Yeah. So uh, when I was making the film, Jacques Courcil uh, volunteered to help me. Uh, and of course, many things I know about Glissant, I learned them from Jacques Courcil in many ways. Uh, and, and Sylvie Glissant, that, 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 uh, Edouard's wife. So uh, we worked together, and actually, Sylvie and I wanted to make a film on Jacques Courcil. And he wrote a script, all these things, and of course, uh, he passed. Uh, uh, so thank you for bringing him up, because in many ways, I did not have the mouth to say anything about Jacques Courcil. I received a letter from uh, his partner, uh, other people, and I still don't know how to handle it. So thank you really for breaking that water. That's Jacques Courcil. Now, Creole, what is important about the Creole garden for me is that the trees, the roots of the trees do not kill one another. They actually nurture one another. They feed each other, so they, they grow together. And there is that equality, what the, the, the one tree is the tallest, the biggest, it does not, its roots do not kill the, the other trees, as we see not only with trees, but also with human beings in many ways. So that, that whole rhizomatic thinking was very important that the Glissant shared with uh, the likes of uh, Felix Guattari, or uh, Gilles Deleuze. What was interesting about Glissant, uh, that went beyond 
Deleuze or Gattari, but they are our friends uh, and our politicians, uh, philosophers, Marshall McLuhan, who all wanted to define a totality. That the world is a totality. And they define this to the point that they come to a moment when they say, we are at the end of history. Now, what was brilliant about Greek science, you are at the end of history, Deleuze uh, or whomever, when actually you only talk about European history and a little bit of Orientalism, you left out the whole world and you say we have come to the end of history. Where are the voices of all, all these people? So when he talks about relation of rhizomatic thinking, he is trying to look for those other voices that you couldn't see in your formidable thinkers that you admired. I loved Deleuze when I was a graduate student, but he still is a European thinker who was not capable of thinking even about Martinique, let alone the rest of the world. This, this is, and, and Gleason you know, Gleason used to tell me stories about, let's say when Mitterrand was elected, I think 81, 82 in France, they got into uh, Felix Guattari's car to drive to the uh, uh, Place La Bastille to celebrate together. You know, so he shared everything, I mean, He's a European, he's, he's a Western man, but he's a Western man who refused assimilation, who said, I need to be in the West in order to, to change the West. I'm not in the West to learn what the West can teach me. I need to share things, with, I give them things and they to learn from me. You know, his famous statement uh, in that uh, was always, uh, you know, agis dans ton lieu, pense avec le monde. So this is really, you know, for us in Africa, we always like to say, think in your own space. You know, let's think in Africa. Glissa is saying, don't think it in, in Africa, act in Africa, but think with the world. What he mean by this is very simple. Uh, that is you two, you know, don't just take things with the world. Well, first of all, use your location. This is crucial, wherever you are. You are in Sarja, you use Sarja as your location. But how can you use Sarja to change the world? This is the key moment for Gleason. You know, you can use Sarja to enclose Sarja with walls and say, we are from, we are in the Emirate. We are doing our own thing. We have nothing to do with you. So Gleason said, don't surround your solitude with walls. Share your solitude with the rest of the world. We have a stake in changing the world. You know, we, in Africa that I know better, uh, in West Africa especially, uh, we only think about our identity, our independence. We don't have anything to do with things, but we can change the world. This is what was great for me. So this, you know, for me to, to put uh, these seemingly contradictory elements in conversation, uh, people who are into monolithic thinking, have, have, for example, with the opera of the world, have done criticism like this. Why did you put that white man in your film to say things like that? Why didn't you find somebody else? man is teaching me something. So how can you be so stuck that you can't even take something from someone else, you know? So that's monolithic thinking. Uh, but by reaching out to the other, you get the other to uh, basically see your position too. And then you begin to influence each other. This is what was yeah, very important to, uh, people like Gleason, this, uh, it's a, so, so realization. In fact, Gleason himself, we, talk, we can talk about this a little later. He started this movement of creolization, but he had a problem with the word creolité, which is a noun. Whereas creolization is a process. 
it's unending and coronavirus is the, the proof. The Glissant always say, avec des résultats inattendus. So you creolize, but the outcome is always unexpected. So, and Glissant says, these smaller places of the world, uh, these uh, archipelagos are better prepared for the unexpected than big cities. When the unexpected come in the big cities like New York, coronavirus, or earthquake, or you know, it, all these uh, calamities, the, the trembling of the world that Gleason like to talk about a lot. When they come, people, people are not prepared. So the Gleason always like to say that. So, that, so therefore, to just finish this quickly, uh, he had a problem with creolite because creolite was a continent was thinking like continentals, like the Deleuze, they were continental thinkers, continental philosophers who think the world is Europe. So they bring a little bit of Africa in it, a little bit of something in it, but they don't think in terms of equality. Philosophy is you speak my philosophy. So, 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 Gleason started creolization, and then when Caribbean, they started the movement of creolite, he said, this is not what I was talking about, because they already know. And when you know, uh, you really not, you're not taking this, the discussion anywhere. You have to always leave room for the unknown uh, in many ways. So, so he's, he, he tried to take his distance from even creolization in order to talk about the relation. You know, so Gleason's concept of two mondes is coming from there. It's two mondes is a mond that's not in, you, in continental philosophy. Continental philosophy does not know how to talk about two months where somebody in Brazil, in the Amazon, somebody in Bamako, somebody in Paris or Sarja, they, are, they all have the same intuition. They are all thinking together. How do you create solidarity between their thinking? As opposed to just somebody in Paris telling the rest of the world what to think. Somebody in New York, here the New Yorker, or I don't know, the Atlantic, they are, they're telling the world how to read the world, you know, but they're not taking somebody in somewhere else as an equal in order to think about the world. There is, my answer, I talk too much, somebody should. <laughs> okay, so me. I'm gonna come, I actually, I'm gonna Thank come you. back to yeah, yeah. question yeah. from a different angle, because uh, in a way it's the connection between the three films. Right. And, and, and that connection, I'm gonna come to it from a filmic perspective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but just as a preface, mm -hmm. one of the things about what, you're, you, what you were just saying is the concept of multiplicity. Yes. And multiplicity isn't, is, is, is not assimilation, it's accumulation, it's addition. It's not the either or. It's always the and 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 and. And at the same time, Let me he interrupt also... you because I agree with you. Glissant said that it is c'est l'étendue as opposed to la profondeur. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah okay. and, so and, and translate the... that you better than I am. <laughs> l'étendue et la it's, profondeur. It's, 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 the, um, it's the breadth of something rather than its depth. Yeah. Um, so, um, so and in a way, the other, the other point was he indicated all the different um, thinkers mm -hmm. whose thinking became international and never really made it locally. And I found that really interesting because a lot, um, it's, it's like he said how someone like uh, uh, Fanon was very well known in Senegal, but didn't really uh, was un <laughs> which which is something we know about. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. we know that some of the people you think the world of and have there, they go home and never ever heard of. Right. Okay, but in in but to get to Bonner's question in in a in a filmic way, you actually somehow decide. Actually, it's a question actually. I'm, describing but you tell me if I'm wrong that the, the structure of your films is very much chapterized mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and and it's chapterized 
never identically, but it they're, they're, they're almost the same thing. So mm. in a way, you know, Martin Scorsese once said that, you know, you always end up making the same film over and over again. And yes. I so agree with him because that's what I've been doing my whole life. Same film over and over again. <laughs> and in a way, <laughs> what, uh, what, what you've done, what I ended up doing when I rewatched the films is that I reordered them for myself. Mm-hmm. I watched them a first time and I said, no, they actually must be this way around. It felt yeah. like a trilogy. And and your use of opera of the world in Glisson, although Glisson is actually comes out before opera of the world, it's actually yeah. really interesting. So so my question is the connection again, the connection between the right. three films. And I'm I'm actually more interested in your process. Do you kind of decide? Do, do, did you know they were a trilogy? Because some of the films I did, people call them a trilogy. But I didn't know they were a tri- trilogy. When somebody told me, I said, "Oh, okay, yeah, that's possible." How did how does your process work? That, that's very interesting because I did not conceive them as a trilogy. Uh, Gleason, of course, influenced me in conceiving the three of them. Uh, because when I was making the Gleason film, to, to let you, you in a very simple uh, 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 secret, uh, I think one, you are right. I mean, I'm a film student and a film professor, but I am more influenced by you know, people who are the essay kind of film that you know very well, you know, uh, from Alain René to the writers of Kaidi cinema, uh, even to Jean Rouge uh, to an extent. So I make situations. I make films that are situational, you know, or you call it sequences, and then you connect that to another. But really what what I try to do uh, is to write, to, 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 to use camera to write. You know, I don't want to be too crass about it by camera stilo, the, uh, Jacques Astrick and people like that. But that's really what I try to do. But Gleason made it more complicated. Gleason, when, I, uh, when I invited Gleason at NYU and I was making this film, uh, he said, first of all, I have to tell you one thing, I hate films he loves going to films but he hates filmmaking because he went to edec edec is you know a french was a french famous french the most famous french film school which became famous later on and he said he quit because editing is always montage is always lying Lying, it's not that he is looking for the truth, but lying in a sense that it's not poetic. It's only there to connect things, you know, to string them together, to do, to sude, you know, suture, to suture things together. So he, he said that he left film because he said any thinking, whether it's philosophy or physics or economics, if it's not poetics, he's not interested in it. It has to be poetics. So. He said, you want to make a film on me? Uh, I'm not interested in, in doing a film. So I said, okay, so we keep doing it. And he looked at me and he said, you really want to make a film? I said, yes. So we, we had a trip together from uh, Southampton to New York. And then I said, okay, Edward, I want you to tell me, how, now how, since you don't like montage, how, how do I, I work on this? He looked at me, he said, what's my food? I don't care. He said, if I were you, I would just do some talking and put the camera in the water and that's it. You have the film. And then I thought about it and I'm also deep down a bad boy. I'm not, I said, okay, I'm just gonna do exactly what he told me. And then ironically, he was right and I was wrong. You know, because I just followed his advice exactly as I said, he told me to do this. I'm just going to do that. I'm not going to try any kind of montage. I'll put the camera in the water. 
and I put the camera on Edward. And then I say, okay, that's what you want me to do. Here it is. And that's interesting because I was wondering yeah. how that shot of the pig being slaughtered, how did that end up there? And and you hear Edward saying, that's nice, film it. And here you go. So now yeah, you gave yeah. us the key. Yeah. And, and that got me into so much trouble. Because in the West, you just don't do that. They they, don't, they can't watch it. There's, I love your film, but that part, you have to cut that out. That's not good. They don't know that the film is more than 10 years old. So, so but to answer your question, therefore, uh, that really liberated me with uh, both this uh, the, uh, the Senghor Soenka film and the opera film. I think Gleason is all over the opera film. The way I approach that, Gleason is all over the place uh, in many ways. That, and that's because the opera film is, is this simple. Uh, again, I wanted to make the film on this opera that took place in Bamako, you know, and 2008 or something like that. Because I had gone there with old cameras and filmed that. And then when documenters say, why don't you do a project on the opera? Uh, I said, sure, that's what I was gonna do. But then I remember Gleason said, use your location to think with the world. How can you take your old footage of Bamako and tell the history and the story of the world? Don't just tell us about Bamako. How can you connect Bamako to what's happening in the world? So that was completely Gleason. Uh, in a way. And, and then with Negritude, what uh, really happened is that I just, that was literal writing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in my apartment, I look at the images, I don't know how to edit. Still today, I just write sequences. This sequence comes, and then this one comes, and I write things underneath it. And then when I was done, I sent the whole thing to the editor. I didn't even have to be there. I said, can you bring some uh, something dynamic, some dynamism in this? Uh, so so, so that, that's what happened uh, with, with that film. But again, Gleason was very influential. You know, I, I think this is really, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll just follow up one question. Okay, okay, okay. Because I, I, yeah, you always do that. Mm. You make it sound like, you know, it's not really me. Uh, I have no hand in this and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, but the truth is, it's all about choices. Yeah. You can't tell me that the entire voyage from Southampton to, uh, uh, to, to New York, and, and again, I'm going to connect it to the Negritude film, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know Wallis Olyeka, and I know when he starts talking, right. everything can be used. Yes. Uh, and footage of Senghor exists like no other president. Yes. So yes. in both films, yes. it's yes. really about the choice. Yes. And yes. that's where I think directing a film is yes. really important. Right. No, I agree. Yes. Because yes. it's your voice. Yes. You're getting your yes. voice through, through Glisson and through mm. negritude, and that's that, these yeah, choices and what right, you, you wanted know. to say with them is mm, mm, mm. really and my I, question. I, if, if, uh, I can, uh, if I can say a little bit about that. Yes, yes. Uh, because, I mean, in my film, even the film that I pretended to be a filmmaker, they are always think this kind of choices that come up. If you look at Conakry or Bamako, I'm very, I'm, I'm vulnerable in all of my films and in mm. all of my writings because mm. I put myself in the story. Exactly. And okay, that's what I wanted to point out. A filmmaker usually doesn't do that. Mm. You know? mm. But I want to put myself without a wall behind me. I mm. want to be vulnerable because otherwise I don't understand the theory. If I mm. don't need the theory, I don't understand it. Mm. I think I think Mantia, you're right, and that uh, becomes very clear in the films, in all three, yeah. that you position yourself within that. You're speaking from a very clear vantage point, yeah. and uh, also something that becomes very clear is uh, that you are speaking about and questioning your references. That's right. Yeah. I think that is very clear, you yeah. know, which I find very interesting because these are people you're struggling with, 
you know, be it uh, Kluger uh, or Fatu right. Diome. So it's like you're calling upon them to think with you, you know, like you're doing with, 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 with Vison, um, and you're doing, you're, you're, you're calling Shoyinka to think with you. you calling know, the ancestors. We're all, we're all He's calling the ancestors. <laughs> Well, you know, that is so, what's happening, yes. though. Uh, yes. Look, my, my, the cameraman usually, and they, they, mm. they were all men most of the time, mm. they, were, they, they feel sorry for me. They worry about me. When I was making Rouge, the cameraman uh, was uh, Arthur Jaffa, the, the artist. Mm. He was the mm. camera. In fact, he was the cameraman in Bamako and Conakry. And he... African American wanted us to go to Paris, and you have to be, you have to represent. And I was looking at Jean Rouge like this with some admiration, and then he came and said in my ear that I was being very vulnerable. I have to be careful. I said, Mancha, you know, you have to, you know, he literally because he's trying to protect me. Same thing happened in Kruger too, <laughs> because I completely abandoned myself. And I don't see that naivety as it's an anti-violence violence. This is an expression by Glissa again. It's not, I'm not inventing this. Well, just as Jean-Paul Sartre talked about anti-racist racism, Glissa says anti-violence, uh, anti-violence, you know? So it, it, it's, I'm absorbing them and in order to what Jihan is saying to make my choices to see what I'm looking for. Uh, with, with, as, as Senghor and uh, Wole Soyenka, I cheated a little bit because Soyenka, I wanted to test his, the limits of his knowledge of negritude. <laughs> Again, this is Francophone arrogance. We think that other people don't know because they don't speak French. So, what I did, I did all the research on Senghor and asked him exactly questions that relate to my research. That's the Jihan question. I mean, as a filmmaker, she knows that. And then I told Soyenka, I want to interview you on negritude and ask those questions. And he answered those. So it's a dialogue, but I'm forcing Soyenka's hand to respond. And what happened, basically, I realized Soyenka actually knew negritude better than I did. That's basically what happened. You know, his knowledge of it was so impressive. You know, when he talks about, uh, he called it animisticism, yes. like anime or anim anim animal, but at the same time, mysticism, when he's talking about African ways of spiritual thinking. And uh, what, what he's doing there is what Senghor and other people have, uh, have always been saying. Senghor tells, a story that he used to go see Pablo Picasso uh, in the Latin Quarter, and then on the way back uh, home one day, Picasso said, uh, Leopold, Senghor's name is Leopold Sedar Senghor. Senghor said, yes. And then uh, he said, let's remain savages. Senghor said, no, let's remain Africans. You know, so this dialogue between modernism and African thought was so amazing. So I'm, I knew this from Senghor, and I have to get Soyenka to address them. Same thing with Glissa, I knew the issues that were so important to the thinking process of African Americans, and I wanted Glissa to address them. Because in France, they almost don't make sense sometimes because French people have made up their mind that they are not going to talk about identity, that they are universal. And so they, they, they are sleeping like uh, Rip Van Winkle. By the time they wake up, it's too late. You know, they, you know they're playing with their own identity, but yet they say, no, no, no. These identitarian arguments are not philosophical, they're not universal, they're not interesting. And in fact, when you look at the left, people like Jean Lou Amzel, it becomes worse. The leftists are worse than the, the right, the Le Pen, the right wing, basically. Uh, they just, they are against African rising and talking about their histories. They say, no, talk about universalism. So, uh, yes. One of the I things my vulnerability to do those things. Go right. Ahead. Yes. Uh, Bona, do you want to follow up on this or? 
Well, if I had to follow up on this, um, I will I will come back to uh, the structure of storytelling. You know, uh, Jihan talked about the chapters, and uh, you also mentioned you really wanted uh, this opera in Mali to 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 tell this story. Yes. Now, um, one thing that I kept on asking myself is. Um, does the opera form in Mali have to relate to the opera of the of the world? You know, think having design in the back of my mind uh, as a um, as the way of telling. Now, I I I I mean nothing against Kluger because I think he's really a smart guy, as his name says. Kluger means smart, mm -hmm. intelligent, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, I was questioning myself if the opera, the form it has, especially the opera in the West, if it can tell the story of migration, right? You know, in this extended form, right. and I had the impression that uh, because when he talks about every error in the development of of, uh, of the world in the past four hundred years can be seen in in the opera, you know, I thought that you know it is still a very European. It is, form yeah. yes, yeah. of understanding the so I think that so I, I think my question is the language of storytelling and the limitations of certain languages in telling our own stories right right you know right. so I don't know so I would like you to talk about that you know that form the language you know using opera and also of course in lieu of the discourse of of, of negritude you know because you know at the point where you know uh, Senghor so proudly says we're opening an art school where we'll have music and of course he's talking about opera and classical music, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's so proud about that. So, so again, what are the ways in which we will tell our stories? Right. This is important. And I go back to Glissant again. Uh, he, he, he talks about the genius of place. Everything you want to tell, it has to go from your place where you are located. And that place has a genius. But he's always concerned about, so therefore you tell the story of your place, definitely. What he's concerned about, whether it is negritude or uh, the decolonization movements, is to erect difference to the same position as the identical. What I mean by that is that, uh, you know, you read Fanon all the way to the present writers, Homi Baba, uh, the other, well, to, to Bona, for example, <laughs> you know, the other, is a construct of the West. It, it, you know, the other is the, this, ob, if you can call it object, if you're going with Afro pessimist, uh, that looks in the mirror and always see the identity, the, the same, the white man. So you, Keep trying to, you are an avatar of the white man, the white woman and so on. I think white woman probably wouldn't want to be in it, but uh, so you are an avatar, you are the inferior model of the original. And Gleason always says that make sure that in fighting that that superior so-called model. You, you see this in, in Fanon's uh, argument in a black skin, white mask, which is brilliant because when he talks about both the white man and the black man are both, some, not all, but both these, they are both hunted by a neurosis. Neurosis, the, the superiority complex and the inferiority complex. And his role as a doctor was to cure both of them. And he says to us, if you 
if you don't fit in this category, if you are normal, like a child growing up in Senegal where everybody is black, then my book is not about you. But of course, what we know later was that not only Fanon's argument was taken on the other by the US, Latin America, all of Africa, you know, that everybody has become the other. Now, Gleason warns us against this by saying, make sure that difference does not become an identity. Difference has, has to always be something that could keep uh, evolving. Because to him, he can, he can build the world without assembling differences. And all these differences are equal. Yes, I mean, he also goes ahead to say, to talk yeah. about the importance of difference in making relations. Mm, and yes. he said, it is not about the big differences out there, but there's so many small differences that I are agree. Pre prerequisite, yeah. you know? in yes. the making and the formation of relations you know i agree that, yeah. but, but, and he in fact he, he said he, i think i completely agree difference he cannot we cannot define differences by either saying this come first and this come last last this is bigger this is smaller all differences are equal to gleason they are essential and they have to be assembled assembled in order to make the world. This was very important. So the, 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 the answer really to, to your question is that our local stories are very, very important. Uh, for me, uh, in main, to, to come to the small Bamako opera inside the world opera, Hey, if you ask me, you know, the, the most important scene for that film, uh, which was a found footage we found on the internet, was the Syrian guide reciting poetry by the water. I oh, thought that, 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 that moment told more about my film than any other moment, than my, my, my footage or any other place. So we had, and I, I shot that scene like three times, because I found the real Syrians in, in Athens, and they recite the Maulad, <laughs> the poems, but it didn't work. Just, it's just this handheld camera and this guy bursting into his poetry, and I don't speak the language, but I could feel what is poetry. I could really feel, I said, this is what I want. When I talk about immigration, this is what I want to say. And this is what the opera, Opera di Sahel, yeah. want to say. It, if, uh, I'll barge in for a second, because I think really, if you look at the Negritude film, the opera, all three films, ultimately what they're really transmitting is that don't block out this alternative knowledge. It's going to make the world a better place. That's right. Yeah. And that's what is, is quite amazing about it. And I think that in especially in Negritude and Glissant, um, one more, more pointedly than the other, this whole discussion about religion and spirituality and, and the idea of being anchored, spirituality is anchored yeah. in the knowledge that it might not happen in my lifetime, but that knowledge is there to exist and make the world a better place. I mean, I think it was Soyenka when he was talking about the rocks and the sounds and how that knowledge, that, that intermediary space, that liminal space that has been wiped out is, yeah. is I think, very powerful in, in, in a way. And the, well, my question to you is, obviously, in, in everything you've said, you're kind of feeling your way around the important things for you. So the same uh, mm -hmm. stories, uh, uh, not says the same thoughts are recurrent and you're coming at them in different ways. But in many ways, just to connect it to the present and to the, you know, George Floyd today and the current yeah. situation, yeah. what is actually happening is that suddenly the word is getting up and saying, hold on a minute, let's listen. And you're standing there thinking, that's, that's pardon right. me, 
The same thing happened in 92, the same thing happened in 85. But now they're willing to stand up and listen. Right. It's brilliant. So, I mean, it, it go, it go again. What would goes, Glisson say about this? Is is one okay. panelist oh, Glisson asking? Glisson love this. <laughs> uh, Glisson love this because I, I think we are doing a difficult thinking. Bona, you and you all are pushing me to to face it. This is the story, our story, the local story, or however we want to put it. The difficult thinking uh, goes around that. And we are also all worried about the story getting lost. You know, you got to go look for the story. You, you can't let the story get lost. And for somebody like myself, where I have a million things happening at the same time, people may worry that the story gets lost. So uh, this, this kind of bring us to, okay. On the other hand, Glissa, myself, I'm sure the two of you, we are also writing about the West trying to, in a totalitarian manner, to totalize the world. They are the world. And they say, you know, if your story doesn't fit in, in their story, your story is not a story. Uh, so. George Floyd and Gleason, it's, it's really, it's a brilliant point. And I think he will address some of her, her bonus points. I've been thinking about this. What would Gleason say about this? I think it goes to, of course, it goes to religion. It goes to mysticism. And it goes to poetry as the energy that is distributed in the world, it's in all of us. Some of us hear it more, some of us decide not to hear it at all, uh, but it's, it's in all of us, it's in the streets, it's in the trees, it's in the birds. Relig religiosity, spirituality, poetry, they are there. This is Gleason's point. This is really what connects the world, but as the world become technologically very advanced, people become too deaf to this to religion, to spirituality, to poetry. They, they do this. And in the US case, we come to George Floyd. And I, I told you my story with Angela Davis. Three years ago, we went to Florence and Paris. Every question was, well, uh, what, what is the meaning of this Black Lives Matter? Does it mean that white lives don't matter? Or if I'm a Métis, does it mean that my life doesn't matter? It, it, only Black Lives Matter and Angela Davis went through, she really, because we wanted her to tell us her, her, her thesis, she had two points. One is uh, abolitionist feminism, and the other one is that everybody knows uh, the prison industrial complex. But people just wanted to know what, what is Black Lives Matter? So Angela said, look, if you know America at all, America was built uh, on the oppression of black people, African-Americans. White, whiteness is always rise, and then you get all these people in the middle, black people are always at the bottom. So when uh, you tell people black lives matter, and Jehan, thank you for historicizing it, you know, because you look at the US, from Plexis versus Ferguson, you know, but also slave, the slave, slavery moment to uh, the bosses. Uh, Jim Crow's, yeah, yeah, you know, and onwards. What you hear all lynching, Emmett Till, this is what you hear all the time, but people, for whatever reason, remain turned deaf to it. And what made people hear George Floyd? You know, I like to tell people that George Floyd is like a Jesus Christ figure. If you see him, the way he's walking, his hands uh, tied behind him, he can barely walk uh, and they're taking him down. And it's like he's on uh, some kind of cross. He lies down. He says one word, I can't breathe. I said the other word, but I can't breathe. The whole world heard it. The whole world heard this. And suddenly, you know, in the streets, you have more white people 
uh, saying Black Lives Matter than Black people. If you go to, uh, I don't know, Pakistan, you go to Bamako, you go to all different places, suddenly everybody is saying Black Lives Matter without asking the question, what about the other lives? Angela Davis said, if you can, if you can see that the person who, the life of the person who has been historically at the bottom, that person's life, the life of an insect, the life of, you know, a butterfly, if that matters, then all life matters. It's the sacredness of life that is behind Black Lives Matter. Yes. Thank Angela, you so much. Yeah, this was Angela Davis's answer to people three years ago. Mm -hmm. So as an admirer of Angela Davis, I, I called her right away. You hear what people said, she said, no, let's move on to the next <laughs> day. Because let's go yeah. again. So she said, I'm very happy that it went to the mainstream. So now I can deal with mm -hmm. more difficult things. But uh, Bona, yes. Yes, Mantia, um, I wanted to ask about the multiplicity of the I can't breathe. Yes, we can't yes. breathe. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's because right. at, at the as the at the moment we are speaking, there are mm -hmm. possibly hundreds, or if not thousands, of people saying that we're trying to cross the Mediterranean. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. so so uh, that uh, it's important to 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 talk about George Floyd and so on. But we should think also about that multiplicity. But I think my question is actually about that those borders and i think that this is another aspect that um yeah. mm -hmm. comes in all of the films essentially mm -hmm. we've talked about the cognitive borders and transcending those but the physical borders and i like the fact that you in in three of the films you really you really put the finger in the wound by mm -hmm. talking about that you know uh Misson, uh talks about it in a beautiful way when he says that he doesn't want borders to be eradicated because he wants right. to have the flavor, the, saveur, <laughs> the, saveur, the flavor of, of, of crossing no borders. French, but he wanted to change the French people to become exactly. more African and Caribbean exactly. <laughs> and Algerian yes. and Tunisian. But, but I'm sorry. But, but, he, but, but he said he wanted the borders to be more permeable. Okay? Yes, porous. And, uh, uh, yes. Yes, more porous, you know. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka says, you know, okay, at some Probably point... There is a better world, by the way. So, no, I didn't, you know, so yes. go ahead. I'm sorry. Exactly, no. So, I wanted to, you to talk about this, this, this physical borders, again, in relation to this impossibility of breath, you know. And, I mean, we can, we can push it further because in a lot of the... Of, of, in these films, you also evoke the sonic so much and the breath is extremely important in that you know when uh, uh, um, uh, Mackey, the poet talks about the precarity of breath you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, 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 I think of this moment you know so maybe you should talk about the borders in the three films and in relation to this this impossibility or the limitations of breath yes uh, in many ways I, I make films, they are filmmakers, I don't call myself filmmaker, but I make films to see if I could address some of these themes. Uh, so when you read, maybe I make films out of guilt. I, to go quickly to earlier point by Jihan, to talk, tell, I went to France with a laissez passer. Laissez passer is like, it's not even, you know, it's not a visa. It's not a visa by the French embassy. I went to the Mali police station, got a laissez passer, took a plane, and went to Paris. To go to the United States, I went to the American embassy. I want to go to America. What are you going to do there? I'm going to study. Who's going to pay for your, your, your studies? I said, my father. They put it, a stamp on it. I mean, I send money to my father. So I said, my father, 
they gave me a visa right there. And then I was able to study, work honestly in restaurants and other places. And I am who I am today. And, to, and I see people dying, people, middle-class Africans who work all their life to save money and they try to cross the borders and they die from the Middle East, from different places. And most of the time, the West, because of the exploitation of the mineral, uh, you know, natural resources from many of these countries, the politics, they destruct people's uh, lives. And these are the people who want to go to the West and they die. And this is really what disturbs me a lot. And I, I'm, I feel, re and I'm also part of that West. I'm completely part of that West. Uh, so I make this work most of the time because I feel guilty about that. And if I can play a role in changing the West, because the West is in me, the West is in Bamako now, the, the West is in Sarja. So we can't deny it. We have to figure out how to change it. Just as they are in our life, they try to change us. We need to change whomever that day is. So, so George Floyd was important and I see your point was important because he made that, 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 that poem, I can't breathe. He made it echo in the world. And you talking about the echo, he, he, he made the, his voice be, was echoed all over the world. And because it was, was echoed all over the world, your work is now here in this place to make it enter in solidarity, in complicity with the people who are also uh, crossing the Mediterranean. We now, this helps us a little bit to hear people passing through the Mediterranean to go to Italy or you know, a, the Aegean Sea to go to Italy from Greece, from different places. So really what George Floyd succeeded in doing and only poetry can do it is that we uh, need to become you know, Gleason's notion of the poetics of trembling we have to learn to tremble with the trembling of wherever people are being oppressed. That's what's happening. And uh, how to express that? I can't express that poetically like Gleason when, when he- when, when Oh, he, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Then it's, so we need to hear the echo. Gleason is saying the world is, well, first of all, every time a voice is suppressed, the world dies a little bit. Every time one voice is suppressed, the world dies a little bit. And, uh, and the West, where we are, I mean, since, the, for example, coronavirus, I'm always watching television. And the television actually is always BBC or the American channels. They make you numb to the echo of voices. You don't feel it, it no longer, it, you don't tremble with the world. You see one catastrophe after another one, you stop trembling. And the whole of Africa listened to Radio France International. I mean, if it's not on Radio France, if, if an African country's news is not on Radio France, it's not news, you know? But if you go to people in Bamako and say, I heard this at RFE, then it's true. That's, that's the problem we have. If Radio France doesn't, BBC doesn't say this happened in Nigeria, uh, then it didn't happen. The local radio, nobody, pays attention to them. So how do we teach the world to hear the echo of every voice, that all these voices beautiful, are speaking? Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Mantia, beautiful. Yeah. That's actually, really one uh, Yeah. Actually, about, about uh, stories, telling stories, and I lived in South Africa, one of, one of the issues and one of the big debates is like, who is allowed to tell the story? And yeah. I always found it I understand where it comes from because our local stories and our voices are not heard. But at that same time, that limitation of who is allowed to tell a story yeah. is also a kind of a border. That's mm? right. Yeah. So I kind of want to ask you a question that connects to Bonner's question about borders mm -hmm. and also connected to this 
the story and um, uh, and how the unheard stories right. uh, for Glisson, the creolization, how you would situate that. Mm -hmm. My question basically is story in and of itself, it's not just what we say, it's how we say it. And as he was saying that, you know, the board is like when, when in Negritude, for example, Senghor never says African. He always says Negro African. I know. Uh, and but you have as, to forgive him for the historical no, I moment. No, I want, I, I'm not going to excuse him. I do not <laughs> excuse him. Uh, right. And I will not excuse him. No, I know. Because, I know. Because in a way, what Glisson later says about the, the, the violence and the violence. That's right. In I'm many different. ways, that's where the whole discrepancy between Pan-Africanism and negritude came. No, no, you're right. Yeah. Uh, and, and that internal border within us and who tells what story yeah. and how to tell it is, I think, a huge chantier I agree. Yeah. that is a local one first. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with this contradiction? Well, well let, me, let me tell you this, and this exists in many places. When I, when I was growing up in Bamako, all the way to France, all the way to the United States, we weren't supposed to read Senghor. Because people, yet, literally, if you read Fanon, you read Samben Usman, and you come to this country, you, you, one of your very first friends are Amiri Boraka, uh, is Amiri Boraka, uh, Sonia Sanchez. They, you, know, you are in the Black radical thought. And the Black radical thought uh, really did not think that Senghor was contributing to the progress of Black thought because he was too French. So I learned to read Senghor much, much later, long after my PhD. Uh, and probably, again, Gleason taught me how to read Senghor. You know, if because in Africa, look, you have Mongo Betty, uh, Stanislas Adetovi, Samben Usman, Franz Fanon. I mean, all you have to do is, is read some chapters in, uh, in, in the Wretched of the Earth by Fanon, where he talks about while we're being oppressed, our histories are being annihilated. So Fanon was young and really virulent for the good reasons. Uh, he went against all that poetic tradition. He, he starts with Langston Hughes, who says, I've known rivers. He said, you are speaking to rivers while we are being destroyed, to Césaire, the, those who have invented nothing, you know, to Senghor, African women, and so So they were teaching us not to read these writers. And Mancha, we are running uh, out of time. We want to quickly hear about what you're working on. Uh, at the moment, we've got about five to seven minutes left. OK, all right, OK, uh, great. Uh, and, I want to thank the colleagues, but what I'm, I'm what I'm working on, I'm in the uh, São Paulo Biennale, and they are asking me actually to do what has been happening here. They want me to have a parliament of my authors, to have my authors talk to one another. How do I create a room where you have Gleason talking, Sam Ben Usman talking, Angela Davis talking? All of these people having a discussion in one room. So you gave you've given me a lot of ideas about this. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm working on. Thank you. Yeah, from my friends or advice. <laughs> yeah, uh, pl uh, plenty, <laughs> but we'll do this separately. <laughs> Yeah, maybe later. Thank you so much for uh, for this conversation. I'm so sorry. We're going to have to end now. Thank you, everyone. The, 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 there's some questions that came up from the listeners. Don't yeah. you want to bounce? I think it would be a pity because there's quite some beautiful questions, and I think Can Mancia you, would, would be like happy to. Pick, would you yeah, like I to pick up, Bona? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some questions. I'm available, but in for example, to these important people here, so it's their time. <laughs> no, Stanley, for example, uh, Wolokawa Nambua, 
who I think is in New York with you, uh, as would man just say that he is or has moved beyond thinking specifically about black spectatorship now? And if so, has Glisson played a central role in that move? What sort of work is called for on the part of the spectator in his thinking now? You know, Good I think I think that's a that's a solid it's question. Close you to your know, point, so, our stories, yeah. Yes, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. I think it wasn't we, the same question, but it is the same point. Yes, I, I think that you, know, you, you have to keep working on black spectatorship. Every mm. time black people are pathologized, you have to keep addressing it, but don't stop there. So mm. yeah, don't stop there. Uh, because I, th there was a point, please, who, let me make this quickly. The, there was a point, I mean, this is, I don't even know if this is a, a, a a difference between myself and the Afro pessimist movement in, in the US, which is very fascinating. They're going from Sylvia Winter's uh, point about beyond humanism, you know, where blacks are objectified and how they take that to a, a point of uh, Afrofuturism. But people like us, Angela Davis and so on, we're saying the problem is now with the human. The problem is how Western humanity took the center and annihilated the other human. So we, our task is to create a new humanism, you know? So that's really, so black spectatorship, spectatorship is part of that, but it can't stop there because your responsibility, George Floyd's responsibility went way beyond George Floyd, the $20 and all these things. George Floyd is a Christ figure in the world now. So we can't stop there. Mm, mm, mm. No, beautiful. I mean, uh, just also one thing, you know, to shift. And I've been thinking a lot, you know, about that moment where Gleason talks about not to be a single being. And it's something I've been thinking about in, in, uh, for a couple of months now. Uh -huh. I'm relating it to, to Amadou Ambateba, uh -huh. you know, Amadou Abate, when he talks about, you know, the notion of personhood in, in, in Bambara Cosmogony, and he says, uh, we've always been multiple. Mm, <laughs> we've yes. always been multiple beings, you know. So I kind of wanted also, also to end on that, you know, mm. that going beyond singularity and embracing multiplicity, right. which I think is you know, a, yes. more... a, a, a very rich place for discussing that lately. And then the person and myself have been talking about it is Fred Morton. Oh yeah. Fred Morton has used this a lot. Uh, but this would have taken us to Gleason's notions of opacity. Uh, you know, but you know, you guys flattered me and I'm talking about my work. So we didn't talk <laughs> enough about you know, Gleason. But this takes you to, to, to opacity because uh, in Gleason's idea of opacity, first op opacity is the basis for diversity, for multiplicity, because you don't know your own self. There are things about your own self. And I, I was realizing this in this time of coronavirus, you meet somebody in the street in New York and you're supposed to have six feet di social distancing. And you don't know if they're going to go left or right. And you're trying to figure this out. And there are some people who don't care. They just see you. They just come and walk through you. How you handle all these things. Mm -hmm. So the, how you learn yourself and things that you don't know about yourself, you get upset with some people. And so, but opacity would be one place to go into in order to discuss multiplicity. The, the, I mean, Gleason doesn't use the word diversity. He calls it le divers which I'm translating as diversalism. Chamoiseau uses the word diversalism. So we have problems with translations. I mean, who am I? I'm coming from Sonin K. Mandingo. So, but anyway, uh, I know that time is out. But, yeah, but let I'm me ask why. I'm available, but look There's at There's one that. additional question that, that, okay. uh, that came from the public, if, if you don't mind. Uh, me the gentleman is trying to speak through the public and get me, so go ahead. C'est la rhétorique de Jihan. 
<laughs> no, I'm going to get you separately. <laughs> I'm not going to let the negritude thing uh, go away Bazi. that, uh, Bazi that Bazi. easily. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, from Renata Carvalho Barreto. Um, she says, I'm a PhD student in critical media practices at University of uh, Colorado Boulder. I, um, okay, a question to yeah, Professor happened. Mantia. Uh, do you think that it is important to find alternative terms for the concept of multiplicity and rizoma, since they are so tied to the universalisms of the French philosophy? You know, when Glissant was at NYU, uh, Richard Sennett, who's a good friend of mine, who's in the opera film, he basically said, look, Edouard, this is dangerous because multiplicity is exactly what banks do. Banks <laughs> and all the corporations, <laughs> that this is what they do. And then Gleason had to come up with, uh, again, not only opacity, but this uh, his notion of, in order to have totality, which is different from the totality that I was talking about earlier, but a two mond that he also called uh, the Baroque mond. In order to have that, you have to count everybody. So Gleason has alternative words. He, he call, once, sometimes he calls it chaos world. Sometimes he calls it two mond. Uh, and then also he talks about multiplicity uh, or uh, universalism. But what he's trying to do is to figure out a way to count, to bring all the differences together without hierarchizing them. That's where multiplicity is coming. Mm -hmm. Deleuze but uses, also, yes. But also, Mantia, just, just sorry for my interruption. I don't know why we should bother with that, you know. I mean, with all. I'm losing you. Uh oh. Okay, I'll pick it up where where he left Nobody. off. He doesn't know no, where why we should bother listen. with that. Go ahead. You stop it. You know, I don't know. He... I hear you, Jihan, but I didn't hear Bona. Oh, sorry. So I was I was talking about why should we bother about French philosophy? The reason uh -huh. I brought up uh, 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 uh -huh. was exactly because he was situating multiplicity within Bambara yes. philosophy, Bambara cosmogony, That's you right. know? So, so the, the question is in itself, mm -hmm. I think false because it is, so, so when Grissant talks about multiplicity, he's not necessarily just speaking about French philosophy, because multiplicity is, is ingrained in other ways of being in the world, which yes, is right. you know, typically, if, you know, Bambara in that case, right, you know, right. so I, I don't think I should want me to bother about that. that just, just, just to say that more and more in our day and age, this multiplicity is a given. Right. I mean, for the past 20 mm. years, at least, yeah the refugees, mm. everything we're talking about, the migration and the, their children. There's a whole generation, mm. there's one or two or three generations who are both. They have this multiplicity in themselves. And I, when, when I started off by talking about the diaspora, this duality, mm -hmm. it's almost old thinking. Right. People right. to ask you, are you this or are you that? What do you mean? I'm both. <laughs> you know? And more. And, and more. And exactly. more. And, Actually, and more. And I think <laughs> one of the, the, the shifts that have happened recently is this recognition that it's not an either or. And mm -hmm. this recognition that the mm -hmm. multiplicity mm -hmm. lives in harmony within ourselves and within the African culture. Because right. the Africans adapt, and in your film you had all these shots of, they're adapting just fine. Right. They have no problem right. with this multiplicity. It's the other way around that that's, the pro that's a problem. Right. Right. Uh, I think the two of you have perfectly responded to this question. <laughs> I want to go back, because I don't want Jihan to get me. I want to go back and say that Senghor concept of Negro African was excluding all of North Africa. Yes. Okay, so 
I just and, wanted to make and sure. And he tried in Fesman in 1966. He tried to not allow North Africa to participate. No, no. And he never went back on that, even when no, he no. changed his mind on other that things. So you don't think that I'm lying <laughs> in this point. Okay. Thank, thank you all. I know this uh, opens up many other discussions that hopefully we'll find some other time to discuss together. Possible future programming, perhaps. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd just to like to. <laughs> I'd like to just uh, talk about our next program. Our next program focuses on uh, Jihan Al Tahiri, three of her films, which are Cuba <laughs> and African Odyssey, The Tragedy of the Great Lakes, and Behind the Rainbow, will be made available for audiences as a free live stream for three days via the Africa Institute website starting Tuesday, the 11th of August, and will be concluded with a webinar on Thursday, the 13th of August at 8 p.m. Gulf Standard Time, 5 p.m. Uh, London Time, noon New York Time. And that will be moderated by Karina Ray, Associate Professor of African History at the African American Studies Department at Brandeis University, and will feature the filmmaker along with Lonip Lonipa Mokoena, Associate Professor Advisor at the WITS, in Johannesburg and Antonio Tomas, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg. Thank you all again, and I look forward to seeing- Thank you, Ahor, for yeah, having thank us. Thank you, and, and thank, thank you, you, Salah. Thank and you, thank everybody. You. And, and Hor, we're really sorry. We really didn't give you time to even place a word. Like, you know, you get the three of us there. There's no space. But, but <laughs> Well, well, next nice. next time we should if you invite Mantia, you have to give him five hours because <laughs> we have so much to talk to him about Gladly. and we don't and we don't see him that often. So <laughs> So let's continue yeah. this offline and we can exactly. see this is thank really you. wonderful. Thank you for including me. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. We'll speak and soon. then you're including me with two of my junior brother and uh, sister, I mean Jihan and John and this and that. Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Bye-bye. Thank you. Salut. Bye. Bye.